Okay. <laughs> okay, it is Wednesday, May 22nd. We are picking up in Revelation 20 and verse 4. And no, we're not stuck. <laughs> we took a side trip into Matthew 25 to understand it in its fullness. And now we're back into verse 4. So I'm going to read, even though we won't talk about the start of it, the entire verse says, then I saw thrones, and they sat on them, and judgment was given to them. And I saw the souls of those who had been beheaded because of their testimony of Yeshua Jesus, and because of the word of God, and those who had not worshipped the beast or his image, and had not received the mark on their forehead and on their hand, and they came to life and reigned with Christ for a thousand years. Well, we might make it to the end of that verse. <laughs> <laughs> in this class, I mean. <laughs> but uh, let me just recap that the thrones we've seen are, are, of course, representing ruling. And we looked at who goes into the millennial kingdom. We saw from Matthew 25, the, the Jewish ones that will go in from the virgins and the towns. We saw from the sheep and goat judgment, it was the Gentile believers that will go in. We know that the millennial kingdom starts with believers who will go into the millennial kingdom in their earthly bodies. There's not a time of resurrection there for them. They're not given their immortality. They go in in their mortal condition. Because they're going to have children, and their children will have children because they can live out the thousand years if they don't openly sin. We know that, that life is going to go on in any form down here that's going to need guidance, ruling, judging, etc. And that's what we're talking about is those that will be sitting on the thrones. We saw that there are those from what we call this time period, this the church body, if you want that name for it, that will be ruling and reigning with the Lord. We saw that, that uh, the Lord promised the uh, Talmudim, his followers, that they would be sitting on thrones judging Israel. We saw many scriptures that we spoke about earlier about ruling and reigning with the Lord. So I think we've covered that well enough to go to the next phase in that verse, the second part, where it says, I saw the souls of those who had been beheaded. If I stop right there, when it's talking about their souls, it's showing the intermediate time. They don't have a, a body yet, a resurrected body, because obviously the earthly body died. The soul goes on living, but the shell, of course, you know, dies. So we're looking at those, and they're seen in heaven while they're awaiting the resurrection of that immortality that they will receive. We saw them under the throne crying out, how long, how long until you will avenge our blood. Remember that? Well, this is who we're talking about again, and we know from Revelation 6, and since that was so long ago, flip back with me to chapter 6, verses 9 through 11. We see this group here, talking about the same group. And it says in, in Revelation 6 and verse 9, When the Lamb broke the fifth seal, I saw underneath the altar the souls of those who had been put to death, uh -oh. put to death for proclaiming the word of God. I'm dead. Okay. I'm not, thank the Lord. <laughs> but my mic is, I just kept laughing. <laughs> okay. So they been put to death for proclaiming the word of God, that is for bearing witness. And I want to read, I think it says through verse 11, did I not? Yes. Okay, they cried out in a loud voice, Sovereign ruler, Hakadosh, the true one, how long will it be before you judge the people living on earth and avenge our blood? Each of them was given a white robe, that's the robe of righteousness that we're given, our reward uh, for, uh, 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 given to us that are safe, that have come to believe in Jesus for salvation. Thank you. And uh, so they're in their white robe. They've been given that much of their reward, and they're told to wait a little longer until the full number of their fellow servants should be reached of their brothers who would be killed just as they had been. So here's this group again. This is the ones that we're talking about. And we saw from verse 4 in that same chapter, chapter 6, that they were beheaded. Verse 4 we read, Another horse went out, a red one, thank you, and its rider was given the power to take peace away from the earth and made... Uh, people slaughter each other. He was given a great sword. That's not where it is. I've lost the verse that I should have, but we know from earlier. And Oh, okay. It's in verse 4 in chapter 20 that it tells us they were beheaded. My apologies. Back to, to 20 in verse 4. I saw the souls of those who have been beheaded. We know during the tribulation time, beheading is going to be what is common. It is a very quick and how do I say it? It's a sure thing. I mean, if your head's if your head's off, you're dead. <laughs> okay? 
And uh, we saw it when we were back in the earlier chapters, we talked about even the very fact that we have seen beheadings come back into the news media. The first time we heard it, everyone reeled over it, and it got headlines, and it was, it was catastrophic to people's minds. By now, you still hear about it, but it's not headlines, and it's almost... I don't want to say accepted, but you understand. We're desensitized to the horrors of it that we felt initially. I see that as preparation as we get closer, that Satan is working to have the world not rise up against his plan. Because this, this is his plan. He has put these to death. Now, having said that, it was not because the Lord was not powerful enough. The Lord overrules Satan every time. But the Lord does allow those to, at times, become martyrs. We've seen that all the way from the beginning. Those who followed the Lord, who lived on earth with him, I'm talking about his Timothy and his immediate uh, disciples that he poured into. We know that with the exception of Yochanan, we read of a martyr's death for everyone. Yochanan, we don't know. But all the others, we know, suffered martyrdom. So it's nothing new. There is a book out called Fox's Book of Martyrs. If you've got a good stomach and you can read things like that, then read. And you can read of the horrors that people have suffered in the name of Yeshua, in the name of Jesus, for their faith. I can bring you right up to today and tell you that we have seen it and we hear it in our news media. I can take you to Columbine, which was the, the shooting in the high school, one of the first ones that so many copycats have followed. But there was Rachel Scott, 16 years old had given her life back to the Lord just, uh, it was either a few weeks or a few months, I can't remember which, but during that summer break before she went back to school, she got right with the Lord at a Christian camp. She was journaling, that's how we know it. And when the gunman put the gun in her face and said, do you believe in Jesus? She knew her answer depended on her life, and she still chose to say yes, and was immediately ushered into the presence of the Lord. So we see martyrdom happening. It's not anything that's new, but it's going to be so much during the tribulation period. Remember, if they don't take the mark, they're not going to be able to live, um, for the most part. There will be those, because we look at them, who will go into the Leo Kingdom, but a great majority of the number will be martyred for their faith. They will be hunted down, and they will... Uh, they, remember, we looked last week at, um, with the sheep and goats, the Gentiles, that the, the sheep go into the kingdom, and the goats were cast out. The sheep showed their faith by helping those who were in need. They fed them, clothed them, uh, gave them water, visited them in prison, etc. That's all because this is what's going on. And who's going to do that for someone whose life is being threatened if they know their life could be taken from them also? I, I believe the only ones who will step up to that plate are those who have that saving faith, who God pours that strength, the character into them to be able to do it. We saw it in the Holocaust also. We saw many. Israel calls them the righteous Gentiles who gave their lives because they hid Jewish people, their lives on the line. They would be in trouble if they were caught with the Jews too. And we'll see it again repeated toward the Jewish people because the Antichrist goes in a vendetta after them. We saw that from Revelation 12. But also those who have the testimony of Yeshua Jesus, the believers in that time also. So we know that it is a time when much will be happening um, that looks horrible. For the one who goes home, it's all glorious. And home, I mean heaven. But we, we see this as a time when um, the numbers are going to swell, is what I'm trying to say. So many that they could not be counted. And why were they beheaded? It makes it very clear. The testimony of Yeshua, the testimony of Jesus, that is salvation. That is belief in Yeshua Jesus. They're taking their stand against the Antichrist by uh, uh, by their words, by what they're saying, knowing it will mean their death. That they're choosing not to deny their faith in the one true and living God, in the Lord Jesus. And so this is what it's talking about. It goes on and makes it very clear. The testimony is true of Jesus and because of the word of God. The word of God is powerful. It is strong. It is not that it cannot protect them that God is allowing this course of evil to run. And the, his, he tells us he numbers our days. Before we even came onto this earth, he knew our beginning and our end, according to his will and his purpose. And so in that, 
They're willing even to lose their life here, and we're even told those who lose their life here in martyrdom are given a special crown or special reward for those who go on. Not that we take this lightly. Again, another phrase that describes them completely and clearly, those who had not worshipped the beast or his image. Remember, taking that mark is worshipping him. It is bowing down before him. It is pledging allegiance to the beast. They're going to know and realize that, and that's why the believers, true believers, are not going to do that. They're going to stand strong, even if it means their death. Okay? So, they lose their life here on earth. They did not receive the mark in their forehead or on their hand. I think we talked about that when we were at that place. Um, I think it's chapter, oh my goodness. It must have been 16, the end of 16, because 17 goes into mystery about one. So I think it was just before that. Anyway, we did talk about it before, so we won't go into that detail now. But it says that we, we were looking at their martyrdom. We're looking at the fact they are beheaded. We know that that means their earthly body. They have ceased to live. But notice it says, and they came to life. They're given a resurrected life, and they're going to reign with Messiah, with Yeshua Jesus, with Christ, for a thousand years. Okay, so... Um, Forgotten to bring something out later. I'll bring it out at another point. But um, what I want to bring out here is that the death of the physical body is not the end. But the spirit lives on, and they're receiving reward even to rule and reign with the Lord for a thousand years during the millennium. He applauds their faithfulness, I'll say, in that way that he uh, brings victory to them. That's the word I want, that there is victory, victory out of death. And it's the victory of the eternal life, a resurrected life, and a ruling and reigning then uh, with Messiah at this time. Uh, we looked at verses earlier, so just to remind you, 2 Timothy 2, 11 and 12 talks about the reigning with, with the Lord. Maybe we ought to look at it. Let's go ahead and look at it. It's been a while. 2 Timothy. And chapter 2. 2 Timothy chapter 2, verses 11 and 12. Here is a statement you can trust. I'm reading out of the complete Jewish Bible. It may sound a little different than yours. If we have died with him, we will also live with him. If we persevere, we will also rule with him. So notice what he's saying. He will give, uh, and we saw that from the talents, those who showed themselves faithful. He gave reward of faithfulness to them, used them in, in ways because of their faithfulness. The same way we talked about if you have more than one child and you have a child that's very responsible and a child who is irresponsible and you have something that's critical that, that needs to be done and, and needs to be judged right and well to be done, you'll give it to that responsible child. You're not going to give it to the irresponsible one. So here, that gives us kind of a parallel to understand here. So if we persevere, if we show that, that we have that quality of strength that stands in, in the Lord, in his word, and yet wisdom from him to in how we do, or I shouldn't say we, but these who he's talking about here, then they will also rule with him. If we disown him, he will also disown us. If we don't show that faithfulness to him, then he is not going to give us a position of faithfulness either. If we are faithless, he, um, I'm sorry, if we are faithless, he remains faithful, for he cannot disown himself. What he's saying there is he does not cut you off and you lose your salvation. If you're his, you're his. Whether you're a good, faithful child or whether you're in need of correction, <laughs> you still belong to him. So what do you gain or lose? You gain or lose in the ruling with him. He's not going to reward you with ruling if you have not shown yourself faithful and deserving of that reward. That if you do show yourself faithful, and worthy of that reward, then he will reward you likewise. So you, you cannot read into this loss of salvation because he makes it very clear. He's not going to disown. You are his. You belong to him. But do you not want to please him? Do you not want to be a right relationship? Wouldn't you like to receive reward? <laughs> Who doesn't? So it's a word to the wise uh, in this, just as we remember, and especially during the tribulation times when it will be so difficult that God will honor them for their faithfulness to him in the reward, in the ruling and reigning with him afterward in the millennial time. 
On our way back to Revelation 20, we'll stop off at Revelation chapter 5. Oops. Okay, let's try that again. Revelation, and we want chapter 5. And we will look at verse 10. Revelation 5, 10 is uh, speaking of the Lord. We saw the lion of the tribe of Judah. He was the lamb who looked as if he'd been slain, because remember, he's no longer the slain lamb. He's now roaring, the lion. Uh, he is raised from the dead. And we see that it says, You made them into a kingdom for God to rule. Kohanim, priests, to serve him, and they will rule over the earth. Here again, we're being told that these who are the faithful, the ones that have lost their lives, it's not that they don't receive reward for that, but they will receive that crown, um, and they will rule and reign with him. So we see it in, in two different places here. Um, back in Luke chapter 22, verses 28 to 30, and I should have taken you there before I took you back to Revelation, but that's okay. I'll give you some practice running around in your Bible. Luke 22, we're going to see that this is talking to the Talmudian now, to the, his Jewish followers when he was living here on earth. And he said to them, verse 28, Luke 22, verses 28 to 30, you are the ones who stayed with me throughout my trials. Just as my father, and it's capitalized so that we realize it's Yeshua talking about his father in heaven, God the Father, gave me the right to rule, so I give you an appointment, namely to eat and drink at my table in my kingdom, and to sit on thrones judging the twelve tribes of Israel. Here's where he's telling his Talmudim, specifically his disciples that were there with him, that because they've been faithful with him through his trials, and it will continue till he is back in heaven, that he is going to rule and reign, that the Father in heaven has given him that position. We know that he comes back, King of kings, Lord of lords, comes back to rule and reign. And in his ruling and reigning, he says, and that's his kingdom on earth, he said, you'll, you'll sit, eat, drink at my table, at the king's table. You'll be right there with me, and you will also be sitting on thrones. These are lesser thrones than his. His is the highest throne, but they will be under him ruling and reigning also. So there is the promise to his followers. Okay, we'll go back to Revelation 20 and verse 4, and we see how long it is. It's for a thousand years. Now again, we know that I will take the Bible literally where I can, where I cannot. I'll take it and find out what it does mean. Sometimes it has both meanings, a literal and an allegorical. In this case, we are seeing again and again and again, six times in these uh, seven verses, a thousand years. Believing that to be literal, the length of time of the Millennial Kingdom, we see that the followers of Messiah are being promised to rule and reign during the thousand-year reign here on this earth. Now, when we saw that start, we saw it start in Revelation um, chapter 19 when he came back. We're going to take a quick peek there. Sure we are. Okay. One tablet has frozen. <laughs> we'll go to the other one. Revelation chapter 19 and verse 11. Revelation 19, 11. We have, next I saw heaven open and there before me was a white horse. Sitting on it was the one called Faithful and True. And it is in righteousness that he passes judgment, goes to battle. We saw him come out of heaven in that righteousness, put a stop to the battle of Armageddon, the sword out of his mouth, which we know was not a literal sword, but we know that as he spoke, so what happened, just the same way as God spoke, the worlds were created. That was the end to the Antichrist, into the false prophet. They were cast into the lake of fire. We'll see that again in just a little bit. But we see, uh, if you follow on down from 11, 12, you see that the eyes like fiery flame. You see the judgment that's taking place there. And then as it continues down, Verse 16, you have his name, King of Kings and Lord of Lords. And then as you come on down into verse 20, I mean chapter 20, I'm sorry, back where we are, we see that we're just following through. 19 dealt with the end of the tribulation. 20 is dealing with the millennial kingdom when God's will on in heaven would be done on earth. So uh, if we are correct on this, this rules out that all millennial view, that, that there isn't a literal millennial time God's rule just comes, we're going to, the world's going to get better, and we'll all see it. And it also leaves out the post-millennial view that says that the Lord will return after the thousand years. That we'll have a thousand years preparing this earth, have it ready, and then it comes back. 
we're disagreeing with both those views. We're seeing that he comes back at the end of 19, at the end of the tribulation, puts his stuff in the battle of Armageddon, and then he sits on that throne judging who goes into the millennium to allow those who are believers into the millennial kingdom to start it with him ruling and the others ruling under him, as we've been discussing. In summary, then, the characteristics of that millennial kingdom, that thousand years, and we'll hit the, the highlights. We'll not go into every verse and every detail because we did earlier. But we do see that physically the environment is perfect. It's wonderful. Look with me real quickly at Yeshaya, Isaiah, chapter 11, verses 6 through 9. Isaiah, chapter 11, verses 6 through 9. The wolf will live, excuse me, will live with the lamb. At least a different version. <laughs> the wolf will live with the lamb. The leopard lie down with the kid, calf, young lion, and fattened lamb together with a little child to lead them. I hear my mom's words echo in my head. The lion and the lamb will lie together, and the lamb's not going to be lying in the lion's stomach. <laughs> They're going to be side by side. We're even going to see that the lion eats straw. Okay, the cow and the bear will feed together, the young will lie down together, the lion will eat straw, verse 7, like the ox. An infant will play on a cobra's hole. A toddler will put his hand in a viper's nest. They will not hurt or destroy anywhere on my holy mountain, mountain speaking of kingdom, for the earth will be as full of the knowledge of Adonai as water covering the sea. Beautiful scene. Perfectly physical environment with complete shalom there, complete peace. The curse will have been lifted. Look at chapter 35 of Isaiah. Chapter 35, verses 1 and 2. We read, The desert and the dry land will be glad. The arva, the desert, will rejoice and blossom like the lily. It will burst into flower. will rejoice with joy and sing. will be given the glory of Lebanon. Lebanon in her English, the splendor of Carmel, and of the Sharon, they will see the glory of Adonai, the splendor of our God. The desert's going to be beautiful, blossoming with, with roses. We don't see roses in the desert now. There is a desert beauty, but nothing like what it will be like then. We see all of the earth rejoicing because the king is on his throne on earth, and the curse that has, the earth has been under has been relieved. Zephaniah chapter 3. Keep going from Isaiah, heading toward Revelation, Zephaniah chapter 3 and verse 11. When that day comes, you will not be ashamed of everything you've done, committing wrongs against me, for then I will remove from among you those of you who take joy in arrogance. You will no longer be full of pride on my holy mountain. Pride will be put down, wrong will be done away with, uh, the, the, what has been committed wrong will have been dealt with, and right will prevail is what this is saying. And we won't be ashamed. There's that day coming when we'll see the righteousness of the Lord rule on this earth, and we will be shouting out hallelujah. You know, right now when you hear the news, you hear laws that have been passed that are against God's righteous standard. You know how much that grieves us. That will be gone. There will not be a, a law against God's righteous and holy standard. Everything will be right. Uh, we see it also in, in Joel, Yoel, Joel chapter 3, I'm no, sorry, chapter 2, verses 26 and 27. I'm going to have to get this one to work because it's going to be different in the Jewish Bible. I want Joel. I may have to. Okay. We're going to go old fashioned way. That's why we keep it. Whoops, but we. Uh, I try not to use it too much because the page turning gets amplified in the recordings, and that's why I try to do tablets. Uh, Joel 2, 26 and 27, we read, And ye shall eat in plenty and be satisfied. Praise the name of the Lord your God, who has dealt wondrously with you, and my people shall never be ashamed. Now remember, Joel, Joel is speaking for Israel. He's speaking to Israel. This is back. He's one of the prophets to Israel. And we're talking about that. Thank you. Uh, that... Those people, uh, Israel will not be ashamed. Israel, God said, I will be your God and you will be my people. This is when we're seeing that in its fulfillment, when it's finally the, the way that it should be. You shall know that I am in the midst of Israel, that I am the Lord your God, and none else, and my people shall never be ashamed. The Jewish people will finally have it right 
with their Lord sitting on the throne, and we'll see all of earth rejoice. Physical healing takes place also. I should have told you, hold on to Isaiah. Go back to Isaiah. And we're going to go back to chapter 35, and we will see that physically there can be a complete healing there also. Chapter 35 and verse 5, the eyes of the blind will be open, the ears of the deaf will be unstopped, the lame man will leap like a deer, the mute person's tongue will sing, in the desert springs will burst forth, streams of water in the arba that's in the desert, and it goes on, uh, I'll go ahead and read 7, the sandy mirage will become a pool, the thirsty ground springs of water, the haunts where jackals lie down will become a marsh filled with reeds and papyrus. Are you seeing beauty? Are you seeing how it is just all glorious? Everything will be beautiful at this time. Uh, remember when they go up to the temple of the Lord and they come back, the countries will receive the rains that they need. Why do they need rains? Because they're still dealing with the, the fact that people need to eat. So they're still planting crops. And the crops need rain, they need the sunshine, they need both to grow. So we're seeing all of this will be what is happening. The land will be very productive. Amos, Amos chapter 9. It's one of those little books, you're heading back toward the end of the original. Um, verse 13 and 14. Amos chapter 9, verses 13 and 14. And we read there, the days will come, says Adonai, when the plowman will overtake the reaper, the one treading the grapes, the one sowing the seed. Sweet wine will drip down the mountains and the hills will flow with it. I will restore the fortunes of my people Israel. They will rebuild and inhabit the ruined cities. They will plant vineyards and drink their wine, cultivate gardens and eat their fruit. I will plant them on their own soil, no more to be uprooted from their land, which I gave them, says Adonai, your God. And I say, hallelujah. <laughs> Israel has waited a long time for this to come and to be true. Looking at that, the, the plowman overtaking the reaper, the one sowing, the one reaping, what it's saying is that it's going to be continuous. There's not going to be a period of time in between where there's a void or a drought. It's continual. That, that when one plant, when uh, harvest is coming, the other's already planting for the next harvest, and it will just continue on. The, the hills flowing with the wine. The grapes, the wine from the grapes is showing that it's uh, affluent, that it is um, bountiful. It, it's a beautiful scene. And then especially to plant the vineyards and drink the wine from it, cultivate the gardens, eat the fruit. How many times in Israel's history, because of her disobedience, she would plant, but she would not be the one who got to reap. The enemy would be the one who would come in and reap. Remember Gideon? He was even hiding trying to reap out his harvest without getting caught by the enemy who would take his crop away. So it's beautiful that they finally will be able to eat the fruit of their labor, literally. And the most beautiful part is that end, no more to be uprooted from their land, which I give them. It will not happen again. This will be their land and continue forever. You can also read that, I won't take you back right now, but Yoel, Joel 3.18 talks about that productivity too. I will take you back to Isaiah one last time. Uh, yeah, well, hold on to Isaiah, okay? <laughs> we'll be there for the next two quick thoughts. Isaiah, we want this time chapter 11. And in Isaiah chapter 11, we're going to look at verse 9 and see the time of peace and tranquility. We've been talking about it. Uh, I'm not sure that I read it earlier. I think I may have it. Let me bring it out clearly now. They will not hurt nor destroy anywhere on my holy mountain. When God is speaking of his holy mountain in scripture, he's speaking about a whole kingdom. He's not talking about one mountain peak. He means his whole kingdom. Okay. When we saw the stone cut out without hands, uh, grew like a, a, a mighty mountain, we know that's the, the Lord and his kingdom. Remember, he comes and he strikes that image. All the... The gold, the silver, you know, all the way down, it strikes it on its toes, it's pulverized. It is never to rise up again. And then the stone wrote, uh, fulfilled, not fulfilled, I'm sorry, filled the face of the earth, the kingdom of the Lord that came in. That's what this ta is talking about also. And the whole earth will have, be full of the knowledge of Adonai. They will know he is Lord. And that's beautiful. Even, even so much as if, like, the water covering the sea... How much water's in the sea? <laughs> the water's covering the whole sea. So 
endless is, is the idea there. That is um, Yeshaya 11 and verse 9 for the peace, the tranquility. We see also in chapter 25 of Isaiah the longevity of life. Remember we talked about the thousand years? And here is again why I take it literally. Because here when we read in Isaiah 25 and verse 8, talking about this same time, it says, He will swallow up death forever. Adonai Elohim will wipe away the tears from every face. He will remove from all the earth the disgrace his people suffer. For Adonai has spoken. Well, he's just mentioned um, swallowing up death forever. So that's the, this disgrace that he's saying that he'll remove. And let me show you following through on that thought in chapter 65 of Isaiah. 65 and verse 20, we read, coming right up with it. No more will babies die in infancy. No more will an old man die short of his days. He who dies at a hundred will be thought young, and at less than a hundred thought cursed. So what's that telling us? If a hundred-year-old is like a ten-year-old a day, like a child, the thousand years is the, the man that lives to be a hundred. So that's the idea that it's giving, that if they died at a hundred, it's as if they died in their infancy, as if they died as a child. They can live out the thousand years. So remember, you asked me now, well, then why do they die? Well, remember, if they step out of line, the Lord is ruling with a rod of iron. He is very quick to judge, to keep everything in line, to keep it right in the way that it should be. Remember Ananias and Sapphira. When they lied to the Holy Spirit, they immediately dropped dead. If they step out of line, their life will be cut short. You see that? Well, you're going to toe the, the mark. Okay? I'm not going to get out of line. So you see how it keeps... Uh, sin and wrong under control. So if they don't do the, something like that openly, then they are able to live out the time. So they may have entered into, uh, well, let's put it this way, the, the people who enter into the millennial, of course, are various agents. But as I mentioned, they keep their human body. We're not told that they change it for the immortality, so they continue to reproduce. So if in the beginning few years of tribulation, a child... The millennial, I'm sorry, in the millennial, the, the baby is born, that baby can live to be almost a thousand years old, can live that whole time. Those parents are not going to bury that child, and that child's not going to bury their parents if they stay in obedience and compliance to the Lord. So here again is why we see the, the length of days. Zechariah, Zechariah, chapter 8. Zechariah almost... Oops, almost to the end of the original. Chapter 8. There we go. And verse 4. Zechariah 8, verse 4. Adonai Sabaoth, Lord of hosts, says, Old men and old women will once again sit in the open places of Jerusalem, each one with a cane in his hand because of their great age. So they can be 990 years old, and they can be leaning on their cane, but they're still sitting in the streets of Jerusalem watching the prey go by if they want, or whatever they're wanting to do. So they, they age. It's not that they don't age, but they don't come to a death sentence. They don't age so much the body is decrepit and dies. Remember also at this time we've got the healing for the, the nations. Uh, in the trees that talks about the leaves for the healing of the nations. Well, that verse will come up in a moment. And, um, it's also in Revelation 21 I think. So we'll be coming up with it again but I think I'll have the reference here in a moment. But also, remember the divine physician is the Lord He Himself. So if they have a need, they can go to the Lord for that healing. He will be right there. So, um, so again, they can live out the entire thousand years. They came, and those who came to life are the ones that were beheaded, that were seen in heaven. <laughs> they will have their resurrected body, obviously, to sit and rule on the, the thrones. They're not going to have, uh, in, they're not going to be immortal again. They're not going to die. So they will rule the whole time with the Lord because they are immortal. That's the ones that have been beheaded, the ones that have been uh, with the Lord. Those of us who return with the Lord, we know that we have slipped on immortality. We know that, that we will not go on in our human form. That we'll go on, we'll have that resurrected body like Messiah had. Remember when he was able to still eat? He talked, he walked among them. 
but he uh, said that the that he was flesh and bone. He was no longer blood. His blood had been shed. For us, the life of the flesh is in the blood. The resurrected body, it is not in the in the blood because it, it's a bloodless body. He was able, and we know he's able to because he was the Lord go through walls. But in essence, that's how we will be, and that's why he can say, Judy, I need you to go serve me over there in. Uh, I'm going to send you a great place. I'm going to send you to Tel Aviv, Israel. <laughs> okay? And boom, she'll be there. She's not going to have to pack up her luggage, get on a plane, maybe take a boat, whatever. She's going to just be able to be there. So we who are ruling and reigning with him are not talked about in this group that, that live out the time in the physical life on earth. Those are those who entered into the millennial who came through the tribulation, managed to still be alive. They were... They were faithful to the Lord, and they went into the millennial in their human form. So you're saying that the, the ones that are in their natural bodies will grow old in the millennium? They will, but they won't age to the point of death. They'll, they'll, they they'll age in the sense, old. right, because it says here, old men and old women will once again sit in the open places, sit in, in the gates of the community, sit in the streets. They're, they're looked on, and you, they can, you can see that they look old, but... Not decrepit. Not decrepit, <laughs> yes. Yeah. So, so it's better to have the glorified body than to be in their bodies, <laughs> basically. Well, I prefer it. <laughs> I prefer it, sure. This is all done with. We've got that glorified body forever. Yeah, yeah and it doesn't age. No, it doesn't age. It doesn't and we're going to walk among them. They're going to see us. We're going to see them. We're going to talk to them. Because we're ruling and reigning over them. Where they're going to see us as their counselors. They're going to see us as, hey, we've got a problem. And, and Sherry, God's put you in charge over here. What says Sherry? And she'll give your well, words of wisdom. Have, there's going to be somebody over us. The Lord us. always. The Lord, well, you'll have the mind of the Lord. He will enable you because you're not in this human form. See, you're going to have your glorified state. Yeah, amazing. Amazing. Yeah. Wonderful time. Wonderful time. We've, we're through with that tribulation and we are in the millennium. Hallelujah. <laughs> yes, hallelujah. <laughs> Verse 5. The rest of the dead. Okay, now, let me remind you, the ones that we've talked about are the ones that had been beheaded because of their testimony. Also, let me bring out two. I skipped it by accident. We have the one group who was beheaded because of the testimony of <coughs> Yeshua Jesus. And because of the word of God. Then we have another group. Those who had not worshipped the beast or his image and had not received the mark on their forehead or on their hand. In other words, there, there are different. Some lost their life because they were beheaded. Others lost their lives in other ways. But they lost their lives because of faithfulness to the Lord. Okay, so those are, are the ones who have come back to life and are ruling and reigning with the Lord. Now, there's others who are dead. They died. They did not die in the Lord. Okay, we've seen that all the way through time, all the way back from the beginning of, of mankind on this earth. People have died without the Lord. The rest of the dead did not come to life until the thousand years were completed. Okay, so there is <coughs> this resurrection of those that are going to rule and reign with him, but there are others who have been dead and stay dead. Uh, they're not brought back to life until the thousand years are completed. And it says this is the first resurrection. Okay, so let me explain to you. Um, okay, I want to make it real clear. So let me say, when I talk about the rest of the dead here, what I'm talking about are unsaved people. Okay, I want to make sure I make that clear right from the start. They were not brought back to life. They were not resurrected. Now, that first resurrection has just been mentioned. This is the first resurrection. We're going to see that, in essence, that first resurrection had three different phases. It wasn't all one time, one, one immediate moment, okay? And I'm going to take you through that and show you. In fact, let's go ahead and let's go back right now to Luke 14, 14. Okay. Luke chapter 14 and verse 14. And we read there, how blessed you will be that have nothing with which to repay you, for you will be repaid at the resurrection of the righteous. Okay? There's a resurrection of the righteous when some are going to be 
received their just rewards. They've suffered, they've had other things happen, God has promised them reward, there's going to be the time that they're going to get the reward. Okay, so there's a time of resurrection for those who are righteous. Now, remember I just said we're not talking about the rest of the dead that were unsaved. They weren't resurrected. There will be a time when they are resurrected, but not now. And I'll just tell you, lest it confuse you, they will be resurrected to stand at the great white throne judgment. That is not where a believer ever stands. The great white throne judgment is to stand before the Lord. He will open the book of life to see that their names are not in the book of life because they did not receive him as Savior. They will be judged according to their works for the degree of punishment they will receive in hell forever. So that you've got your, your horrors like the Hitler and the Stalin and, and all of those suffer far more than a little lady who did no harm to anyone and tried to do good where she lived, but unfortunately never had become one of the Lord's. She did not open her heart to the Lord. Okay, They're going to stand after this time. We haven't gotten to it yet. We'll get to it. We'll show it to you in Scripture at the Great, the great White Throne Judgment. That's the second resurrection. Now we're talking about the first resurrection, okay? The first resurrection is of the righteous. We just read that. The first resurrection is of the righteous. So let's look at when that took place. Yes? Oh, go ahead, because I was just going to say, when did that take place? Oh. Was it like Christ after Christ's death when he came in? Okay, hold your thoughts okay. right there because you're on track, but I don't want to confuse everybody. Um, we're going to go to Matthew 27. Okay, well then, I already told you that we see this first resurrection in three phases, okay? Three different times, whoops, three different times um, uh, that we're going to see that refer to this, this first resurrection. Matthew 27, we're going to go to verses 52 and 53. Matthew 27, we know that in this we have the crucifixion, but we also have the wonderful resurrection. Okay, so, um, starting with verse 52, I think we can. We can jump in there because of what I just said. If you look, if you glance at 51 on your way down to 52, you'll see that the veil in the temple was torn in two. We know that happened when the Lord, at the, at the moment of his death on the cross, remember that veil is what separated into the Holy of Holies, the mercy seat, where the high priest would go once a year with the blood to put on the mercy seat for atonement. This is on Yom Kippur, the Day of Atonement, the most serious day on the, all the holy calendar days for the Jewish people. Why was that veil rent open? Because God was showing the way into that mercy seat was now wide open through that shed blood. The blood was put on the mercy seat and salvation was open to all. And as we move in uh, further along, we realize now Jew and Gentile come the same way. Rather than the Gentile having to proselyte into Judaism and keep the commandments, we see now that, that both Jew and Gentile come alike just simply through the shed blood of Yeshua Jesus. Why did I say just simply? There's nothing just about that or simple, but I mean there's no they, there's nothing we do to earn our salvation. It's the shed blood of Yeshua Jesus that does it all. So seeing that change there is it tells us where what time this is for verse 52. Also, the graves were open. Okay, we've had a great, great earthquake, we've had the temple veil rent, and now we're reading that graves were open, and the bodies of many holy people, notice holy people, righteous people, who had died, okay, saints in your scripture, good, who had died were raised to life. Key verse 53, after Yeshua rose, they came out of the graves and went into the holy city where many people saw them. Now, <laughs> you want proof that something's happened, that the Lord resurrected, that something miraculous has happened? If you were living in that time, and you knew you had buried your loved one who had faith in the God of Israel, who had, who had uh, made the, the atonement for their sins through the sacrifices and all that. You know you had buried them. And you're in your home, and you're washing your dishes, and here comes a knock on the door. And you open the door, and there's your loved one standing there, <laughs> obviously resurrected. Wow. What a miraculous sign of the miraculous resurrection 
of Yeshua. Because did you notice how I emphasize after Yeshua Jesus rose? He was the first one that rose from the dead. God raised him from the dead. We are told that, that, that God gave him the power, actually, to resurrect from the dead. It's that resurrection power that Yeshua Jesus works in us to this day, brings us our salvation, enables us to do for him what we do. It's in his resurrection power, not by our might, nor by our power, but by the Spirit of God that it happens. So, Messiah, Yeshua Jesus, would be considered, when I'm taking this, and I'm going to take it into... Um, a harvest to help you understand, uh, he would be considered like the first fruits. Now, remember how we've just come through Passover and the picture of sacrifice that it is? We've just had the veil torn into. Shavuot, the next on the Jewish calendar, is first fruits. But even before Shavuot, on the day after Passover, the people would bring to the temple the very first of the crop that was ripening. And they would bring that, present that unto the Lord. That's a picture of Messiah as first fruits, raising from the dead first. He rose first. Before anyone else, he rose. The graves had been split open so that the body could come out that was, that was raised and would be seen raised. But they didn't come out of their graves until after he rose. So Messiah is the first fruits, and he is called that... Um, I think we're done with Matthew. He's called that in 1 Corinthians chapter 15. I was right. I was afraid to say it, but I was right. 1 Corinthians chapter 15, and we're going to look at verse 23. And we see that each in his own order, the Messiah is the first fruits, then those who belong to the Messiah at the time of his coming. <coughs> This is jumping into it, but it's referring to it because verse 22, just as in connection with Adam, all die. So in connection with Messiah, all will be made alive. Okay, I should have really read 22 first. Then each in his own order. Messiah would raise first. He's the first fruits. And then those who belong to him at the time of his coming. So we're going to see that there are others who are resurrected at a different time. It's called at the time of Messiah's coming. Okay. Go with me now to 1 Thessalonians chapter 4. 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, many of you are very, very familiar with. And I will tell you, if we're looking at this with a crop, you have those first fruits. The original, it came right early. We see Messiah in that. And then you're going to have your main crop. The majority of what's going to come in is going to be right now, okay? The harvest. I'm winded today, excuse me. <laughs> okay, 1 Thessalonians 4, verse 13. You know what, I'm going to do it in this one. I, I like this wording because uh, I'm more, it's, it's the way I'm used to referring to it, and that way I won't confuse you by saying one thing and reading another thing. Okay, verse 13 of 1 Thessalonians 4. 1 Thessalonians written by Shaol, Paul. A little Jewish boy, he's writing to Thessaloniki. It's a community. It was a community of believers who had come together, and he's writing to encourage them and grow them in their little nucleus, in their called out assembly. We today call it a church. Okay? He says, I would not have you to be ignorant, brethren. Now I got to just tell on Dr. McGee, a very famous Bible teacher that people love who's in heaven, and he said, You have to be very careful how you read it. Because you could read this, I would not have you ignorant, brethren. <laughs> and it's not what the Lord says. It's not what Shaul Paul is saying. He's saying, I don't want you ignorant. I don't want you not knowing. I don't want you not understanding. I want to make something very clear to you concerning them who are asleep. Now, at that time, the euphemism for dying, for death, was that they had fallen asleep. Today, our euphemism that's common is they passed away. Now, let me ask you. The one Dosi's sister's son, for your nephew. When we say that he passed away, do we mean he just moved from this chair to another chair? No. We mean he has departed from this earth, do we not? His body has died. That's what they meant when they said they who are asleep. Okay? What's happened? The people who are believers, who know that the Lord is going to come, because Paul's talked to them about that and said the Lord's going to come for them, well, now they're standing at the graveside of loved ones, and they're thinking, they've missed it. They've missed out, and they're grieving. And he's saying, no, 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 don't miss out on this. Don't misunderstand. I don't want you ignorant here. Uh, those that you love, those who have fallen asleep, 
that you don't sorrow as those who have no hope. Now, the unsaved community today, when they lose a loved one, that's it. It's over in their mind. They have no hope of seeing them again and being with them again. I'm sure you're like me. You've talked to many people who that's the way they believe. But Shaul Paul is reminding them, that's not us. That's not where we are. If we believe, verse 14, that Yeshua, Jesus, died and rose again, even them also who sleep in Yeshua, Jesus, who he's got with him in their death, um, who sleep in Jesus, will God bring with him. Okay? He's talking about then that those who have died are with the Lord. And the Lord's going to bring them with him. Okay, let's keep reading. For this we say to you, by the word of the Lord. Shaul Paul's making it very clear. I'm not telling you this. I'm not saying this because this is what I've thought up and what I'm, written, what I'm writing. No, this is what the Lord is telling you. He's telling you through me that this is what he's saying. By the word of the Lord, we who are alive and remain. That was Paul at the time, and that's the, the, these people in Thessaloniki. We who are alive and remain. Um, and to the coming of the Lord shall not precede those who are asleep. Okay, those who are asleep, those who have died, they're ahead of us in line. How are they ahead? Because they're already with the Lord, and they're going to come back with the Lord. Let's yeah, keep reading. Hallelujah. The Lord himself will descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of the archangel and with the shofar. I should have brought it today. <laughs> with the trump of God. <laughs> and the dead in Christ shall rise first. Okay, remember how the first fruits we saw them come out of the graves who were believers in Yeshua Jesus. They were seen by family and loved ones who knew who they were as a testimony of proof of the resurrection. And that was the first fruits. Now here's all the ones since that time. And we're at 2019, so we're talking about a little less than 2,000 years of believers who have died, who have been buried, their shell buried. But their spirit, we know, is with the Lord. We know that they're with him. They're going to come back with him. But that dead body is going to be brought up out of the grave to meet that, that spirit in the air because they're coming back with the Lord. And we see it's in the air because it tells us here, um, the dead in Christ shall rise first. Then we, who are alive and remain, shall be caught up together with the Lord in the air, and so shall we ever be with the Lord. Okay? Catch it. Where does it happen? In the air. It doesn't happen on the earth. It doesn't happen under the earth. It happens in the air. We are caught up. That's why it's called the, the, the snatching away, because the Greek, that's what it gives, and where I've tied it in with other verses, but that's the rapture is the word that we get from the Latin. It's not the word here. Fine. Throw out the word rapture. Call it the snatching away, the caught away, the caught up, whatever word you want to give it. Just know and understand the truth that has been given to us here. Shaul Paul expected it in his day. We who are believers are expecting it in our day. Someday there's going to be those who are right, who are alive, and who are caught up to meet the Lord in the air, and so shall we ever be with the Lord. Now that fits in with how we have looked and what we've come to the conclusion in our book in Revelation, where we're in heaven with the Lord, when the tribulation is going on down here on this earth, we're receiving our rewards, and we're ready to come back with him in our rewards, a robe of righteousness, ready to roll and to reign during the millennial kingdom. Okay? So, here is a great harvest then. We don't know how many. I can't even hazard a guess how many believers have died in almost 2,000 years that are, would be in this harvest, that are being caught up. How many believers are alive? Well, their body being caught up, meeting with their spirit. But how many believers alive today also are caught up? This is your main harvest, okay? Now, uh, okay, we're good, we're good, okay. I think I've completed the thought there. I want to make sure I have, yes, the third phase. Now, the third phase, go with me back to Revelation 20 and verses 4 and 5. And you have there where we refer to them. They came to life and reigned with Christ for a thousand years. There's your third phase. And that would be like the gleanings, okay? Remember the book of Ruth? She was allowed to go into the field of Boaz. She was allowed to glean. What would be left behind by the reapers, the ones who would get the majority, but they would lose some, 
and those who were the poor, the widowed, the needy were allowed to go in and to glean. So we know it's a little bit left behind, basically. Okay, well that is because these people that are resurrected here in chapter 20 of Revelation, they're the ones that live right. You got it, Rowena. They're the ones who lived during the tribulation, lost their lives during the tribulation for their faith in Messiah, in Jesus, and are now resurrected in, in putting on that immortality because they also are going to come and rule and reign with him. Okay? Because this says that they're brought to life and rule and reign for a thousand years. Now, if I take you real quickly to Daniel chapter 12, we're going to see that even Daniel refers to, where did he go? It's a different order in here. <laughs> okay, there he is, Daniel, to get into the prophetic books. Daniel chapter 12, and we're going to look at verses 2, and I think we may go into 3. Uh, it will talk about two different groups of people here. Yes. Many of those sleeping in the dust of the earth will awaken, some to everlasting life, and send it everlasting shame and abhorrence is how this one gets. So we have two resurrections talked about here. Some are raised to everlasting life. Some are raised to everlasting shame. Obviously, one is glory and one is hell. Okay? There's a separation between these two times. Daniel's not saying this happens at the same time, but he's saying there's two different resurrections. Okay, so the ones who are sleeping in the depths of the earth that will awaken, because Daniel is writing to the Jewish people, to Israel's time clock, he is referring to, I believe, those who we see here in Revelation 20 and verse 4 and 5 that have lived through the tribulation time also, because he doesn't know anything about what we call the church age. He doesn't know anything about this body of believers. So I believe he's referring to that, but if you want to see it for phases two and three, you can see it for phases two and three also, because it's true whether Daniel, Daniel could see it or not. Okay? So, first resurrection, three phases. When Messiah raised, and the, the, the few that came out of the graves that showed proof to those that knew them, the majority and what we call the rapture, the snatching away, the catching up, that happens in the heavens. Not to be confused with the second coming of the Lord. Remember second coming? His feet touch all the way down on the Mount of Olives. He comes down and he sets up that kingdom to rule and reign here for the thousand years. And here's our third phase. When that happens, we see those who came through, I'm sorry, didn't come through the tribulation. Those who had died uh, because they were beheaded or because of the plagues that they suffered during that time, whatever, they died for their testimony, they died for their faith in Yeshua, Jesus, they're resurrected to rule and reign with Messiah for a thousand years also. So there's your first resurrection, three phases. Did I answer it, Arlu? Yes. Okay. <laughs> and our second resurrection, we will see that great white throne judgment when we get to that in just a little bit, a little further down. Yes? Uh, for the first part of the first resurrection, the first fruits, those who came out of the tombs, were they given glorified bodies also? They must have had a glorified body because I, I well, that can be argued. Um, when Lazarus was brought back from the dead by Yeshua Jesus, it was not a, a um, glorified body. It was his regular body. Um, I, and I have heard argument on both sides, and I see silence in Scripture. There are those who believe that it was a resurrected body, and at some point the Lord took them into heaven with him. There are others who believe they lived out again and died an earthly death again. But then um, wouldn't that um, go against the, um, the, picture the doctrine of the first resurrection is Jesus Christ? Right, and if it is like him, so, then yes, it should be. I, yeah, okay, I like your point. Or at least she said, wouldn't that go against the, the doctrinal belief of the, um, how do you call it, how do you say it, the first resurrection? First fruits, first fruits, that's where I was. And yeah, yes, too, because they're a picture of the first fruits, and Messiah does not die again, then I would say, yes, they have the resurrected body, and we're just not told about their entrance into heaven off of this earth. I don't science. think it was called resurrection, he was healed. Lazarus was healed. 
Lazarus was was well. Lazarus was brought back to life. I, I've got to leave it there. He was brought back to life. But when we're looking at these being the first fruits, picture of Messiah, that Messiah rose from the dead first. The point being that he was the first that resurrected in that manner. Yeah, yeah, he had the keys. Yes. Yeah, he already overtook. Death, so right, death is swallowed up yeah. in victory now. So they lost everything, you know, Satan lost everything. Right oh, he did. Yeah. He did. He, he, Publicly. Yeah, the second Adam who came yeah. and regained what the first Adam had yeah. lost, yes. But I'm, I'm going to tend to say I agree whether, or at least seeing the fullness of what I'm trying to communicate, I think that, that really it does ruin the picture if they died again because they're a picture of that, the first fruits of, of resurrection of Messiah who never dies again. And we, Amen. when we're given those resurrected bodies, will live forever. We know that in yeah, our, our glorified state also. Great. So, okay, are we good? Yeah. Okay, very good. All right, let's see. Um, I skipped John 5, 29, and I don't remember what it said. Now, let's take a quick peek because I can't remember why I put it in my notes, and I don't want to leave anything out that I think it could be important. So forgive me. John 5, 29, real quick. Yohanan. Chapter 5, verse 29. Oh, okay, it's just re-emphasizing. And come out, those who have done good to resurrection of life, those who have done evil to resurrection of judgment. That resurrection of judgment is what we're calling the second resurrection that will take place at the great white throne judgment that we will see in just a little bit. We're going to get to it actually pretty soon. I don't know if we will today, but it's, it's coming up real soon. Um, you missed also Luke 20, 35 to 36. Oh, I did, and I like that point there because of the Greek. Thank you. Okay, let's look real quick at Luke chapter 20, verses 35 and 36, and I may have to do it in this one to get it. Um, Luke 20, 35 and 36. But those judged worthy of age to come, the, the millennial, of resurrection from the dead do not get married because they can no longer die. Being children of the resurrection, they're like angels. Indeed, they are children of God. What that's pointing out is that they have a resurrected body. They are not resurrected into, they're not given a normal body again. The body that will age, a body that will give birth, a body that you know goes through everything that we go through. That they're given that resurrection body that we were talking about just now. See, the first resurrection is of the body. The spirit, the soul, that lives on. When you die, that spirit goes one of two places, either into the presence of the Lord or the absence of the presence from the Lord. So that resurrection is the body being resurrected to be changed into incorruptible. Okay? Um, I brought it out before, but I think I will go ahead and bring it out again because uh, it, 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 I think it needs to be brought out. Go with me to Ephesians chapter 4 and verses 8 through 10. When you get to those little books that are all together right there and you wonder what order, do you remember my little story? I give you the order of those four little books. Go eat popcorn. That's the first part of the story, but I like the end of the story better. The true story that there was a professor that was teaching and he knew that, that everyone confuses those four books, Galatians, Ephesians, Philippians, and Colossians, what order they come in when they're trying to memorize or find them quickly. So he came up with an acronym to help his students, and it was um, Go Everywhere Preaching Christ. Wow. Well, that was great. One of the students took it home. He got home, and he says, okay, everywhere preaching Christ, go. No, preaching Christ, go everywhere. Uh, it, uh -oh. it didn't work. <laughs> he, still, he still had trouble with the order. So he came up with the sentence, go eat popcorn, because that can only be in one order. <laughs> go eat popcorn. So this one that was teaching now to this group told everybody, if you want to remember those four books, that's how I remember, go eat popcorn. Well, there was one who I'm going to say must have been a blood little Jewish student in the middle of his group. And he came up after class and said, I have one better. Gentiles eat pork chops. <laughs> <laughs> so when you want to remember, the Gentile way is go eat popcorn. The Jewish way is Gentiles eat pork chops. <laughs> Forgive me for that. So, go to Gentiles. No, 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 no. Where did I take you? 
Ephesians, go to eat. <laughs> We're going to eat. <laughs> okay. Go to um, Ephesians chapter 4 and verses 8 through 10. Okay? Because again, I'm telling, I'm showing you how it is talking about the resurrection of the body. In Ephesians 4, chapter, chapter 4, and verse 8, we read, Wherefore he said, when he ascended up on high, he led captivity captive and gave gifts unto men. In fact, I'm going to read the whole thing and come back and break it down or unpack it for you, okay? Now that he ascended, verse 9, what is it but that he also descended first into the lower parts of the earth? Verse 10, he that descended is the same also that ascended up far above all heavens that he might fill all things. Okay, what are we talking about? Well, let's break it down and let's see it, okay? The beginning. Sorry, got a hair there. <laughs> when he, wherefore he said, when he ascended up on high, okay, we're talking about the Lord. When the Lord ascended up on high, ascended up into heaven, at this point that it's being talked about, it says he led captivity captive. Now that's a phrase that if you don't know the understanding, you won't know what it means. But if you go back into history, you find that when they led captivity captive, that was the victor. And he would be leaving behind him all that was now his booty, all that he had, yeah. had won in that battle. And he would take this booty, um, he would be riding on a horse, showing the majestic rule and reign that he had won, he was victor. And then behind him would be the gold, whatever, you know, all that they had collected that was um, tangible, that was non human. But then those humans that were now his. And in this case, they would be called slaves. They would be his slaves. He'd lead them through the main street of the town. He came back to his town to show his victory and look at all that's mine. Okay? Now, when the Lord ascended <coughs> up high, he led his slaves, his booty, those he had, and for us we know the truth, to be his rescued. It was not bad to be his. It's not bad to Amen. be his servant today. It's, it's wonderful to, to be called his servant and his servant. He Amen. led these on high, it says, okay? And then he gave gifts unto men. Well, what it's referring to here is, remember initially, I had brought to you the study of the, the word Sha'ol. Do you remember that? I'll put it on the board again. Sha'ol, not Shalom. <laughs> Sha'ol, Okay. Now, Shaol had two compartments. It had a paradise side, yeah. and we read about this in Luke 16, well, and we tomorrow. have a suffering side. We are told that Shaol is in the heart of the earth. We are told that it, there is a great cavern in between. So it's kind of like two mountain peaks and a valley in between. When we read about it in Luke 16, it's mixed in with times where the Lord was giving parables, but he gave a name to one of the people who was in the paradise side. And any time the Lord put a name on something, then he's not talking just a story, a parable. He's telling something that is actual, okay? What we read in Luke 16 is two people had died, rich man and the beggar. In the life here on earth, the rich man had everything silver spoon in his mouth, had a wonderful life. The beggar suffered all along. But the beggar had put his faith in his Messiah, in his Savior. And when he died, he went into the paradise side. And now it was wonderful for the beggar. This is also another place that's called Abraham's bosom. If you hear it called that, it's just the name given to it, but it, it, this is what it's talking about. Now, the rich man had gone into the suffering side. He is suffering so much that he is so thirsty even. He sees Lazarus so comforted on the other side, and he asks, just let Lazarus come over and let him just dip his finger in, in water, I think is how it says, you know, I put it on my tongue, just to put a bit of that misery out. And he's told, no, there's a great gulf in between, and no one can cross over. There is no going back and forth. It's separate, okay? What we know from this and from other scriptures is, when the body would be buried in the grave before our first fruits Messiah has raised, before he took his shed blood and put it on the mercy seat in heaven, proclaimed salvation through his shed blood, opened the way of heaven for us to go into his presence. Because we know today, as believers, if we leave this shell, to be absent from the body is to be present with the Lord. We know that from... Um, 
Philippians? Five, five times. Okay, there's five times. So now. Philippians 1, I think it is, 21 to 24, talks about being absent from the body, being present with the Lord. Okay? So we know now, and we're told that the that we are with the Lord. Remember it said the Lord will bring back with him those who have preceded in death? Well, the Lord is not going down to Sheol first, grabbing them and then coming back up and then catching us up. We don't read that. He comes in the air and we're caught up to meet him. So something has changed. What changed is what we're reading here. After the blood was put on the, the true mercy seat, the one in heaven, after the Lord had proclaimed it for us. And by the way, you can read that in those who see him after his resurrection. Miriam at the tomb, he's told, don't touch me. I've not yet ascended into my father. And later you see the women clinging to him, and he doesn't tell them, don't touch me yet. So he was on assignment. He was still going to go do something. But in his love for Miriam, he stopped, and he brought her the greatest joy to know that, she, that he was resurrected. I love that, that he took the time. Okay, okay so on the cross, did he take them with him to paradise, or did he pick them up on his way back? <laughs> <laughs> the thief went into the paradise side when, whenever he finally died on the cross. Okay. Messiah died first, because we know that when they came to break the legs of the three on the crosses to get them to hurry up in their death, mm -hmm. Yeshua was already gone. Yeah. And <laughs> it's not said of the others, so... The thief joined Yeshua in paradise when his last breath on this earth was. Okay? So, this is where they went. They went into the heart of the earth. Let me bring this out right now because she just made me think of it too. And, and let me bring it out to you clearly. There is a teaching out that says that the Lord went to hell for us to procure our salvation. And what they mean is that he went into the flames of hell and took that punishment for us. It's not true. He went into the paradise side. Remember what he told the thief on the cross? Today you will be with me in paradise. Also, remember his last words on the cross? It is finished. Tell the sky. It starts at that moment. It goes on forever. That's the tense it's written in. That's the word that means he procured salvation forever. This moment on, until that point, everything looked to the cross, do the sacrifices, have your Day of Atonement. From that point on, everything looks back, and we know it was all done. If he had to go into hell, suffer in hell, and come back out of hell, he couldn't have said it was done. Yeah. Okay? Yeah. And in Scripture, we're not told that anyone ever comes back out of hell. Satan will not. The false prophet will not. The Antichrist will not. No one ever comes back out of hell, out of the suffering side. That suffering side is still, as far as I know, in the heart of the earth. We don't hear about any change until when God's going to deal with, with it in the future at Great White Throne. We'll talk about it then. Okay, so paradise is here in the heart of the earth, but the Lord is that victor. He's that one that's leading captivity captive. I believe that he did go down to paradise after he put his blood on the mercy seat in heaven and he emptied out the paradise side. He took them marching through, I can just see them following him. <laughs> and if you want to be real honorary, because Satan is a prince of the power of the air, and we know that we fight against the principalities in the air, the power of darkness that's surrounding us. What the Lord did in essence was make a way through Satan's domain, right into heaven, took his bounty, his booty, his captives, took them safely into heaven, now that he has opened the way. So if you want to be honorary, <laughs> I see people going through, knowing they're going through victorious, going, mm -hmm. <laughs> Now, that's not nice, but that's my humanness. It just wants to say this to Satan, you're defeated, you're defeated, you're defeated. Yes, you think you got a victory when Yeshua died on the cross, but it was not a victory for Satan. That was a victory over death. That was a victory that was conquered, that was put under the feet of Messiah, all his enemies are under his feet. And hallelujah, he has made the way set home safe. We don't worry when we leave this body. We're instantly with the Lord. But in that instantaneous passageway through, we are safe. He's made the way through, and we are in the heavens with him. And that's what's being referred to here about, make, about leading captivity captive. Just before I get the questions, let me finish the rest for you. Gave gifts unto men. Do you remember <laughs> that he would give, which to me is the greatest gift, and that is 
his spirit, the Ruch HaKodesh, would come and dwell in us. They were to wait until the Holy Spirit came because he would empower them for the work that they were to do. Then we also know that he has given everyone at least one gift to serve the Lord. Gift of helps, a gift of teaching, gift of evangelism, the gift of apostleship. I missed one. What did I miss? What did I leave out, Pastor Bill? <sighs> They'll come to one of our minds. Help. I said that. What are you talking about? The fivefold? Yes. Okay, you got the, you have the apostles, the prophets. The apostles. I don't have the apostles. <laughs> the apostles, the highest. Okay. We see those. We see the gift of helps in the body. We see that with whatever you can do, um, and I don't, I don't want to say it the wrong way, but if it flows from you as easy, as natural for you to do for the Lord, that's the gift he's given you. That's not you. That's the gift he's enabling you to do for the Lord. So these are the gifts he's given to men. And now it makes it very clear. It says, now he that ascended, the Lord who ascended, what is it but that he also descended first into the lower parts of the earth? Remember he said to Israel, the sign of Yonah in the belly of the fish for three days and three nights? that the man, son of man would be in the heart of the earth for those three days and three nights, okay? That was the sign. So here it is. What is it that he ascended, but that he also descended first into the lower parts of the earth, but he that descended into the lower parts of the earth is the same also that ascended up far above the heavens. He went past the birdies. He went past the planes. He went past Superman <laughs> because he is the real Superman, and there ain't no kryptonite. Right. There ain't nothing that can get hard on me. And it, he did that that he might fill or fulfill all things. He fulfilled all the prophecy that spoke of this. He's fulfilling the plan of God. He procured our heavenly home for us forever. That's all what is being given to us, disclosed to us here. So that first resurrection that deals with that body, the spirit is not caught. The spirit is not hovering over the face of the earth. The spirit is not restless. You hear people say that. My dear Jewish people, often in Orthodox Judaism, believe that for the first year, the spirit does hover and is looking for a place to rest. And, and uh, finally, they get hopefully that rest when there's certain prayers said for them on the anniversary of the first death. No, that's not true according to scripture. That spirit went either into the suffering side, which is still, I believe, in the heart of the earth, or to be present with the Lord since the time of the Lord's resurrection. Okay? Um, it is Philippians 1, 21 to 24 that, that tells us, and we can go back to uh, pork. <laughs> uh, the first, uh, I'm sorry, not the first, the third. Go next to the next book, Ephesians, Philippians. Go to Philippians 4, 21 um, through 24 real quickly. Who shall change our lowly body that it may be fashioned like his glorious body? We're going to get this earthly, the one that, that corrupts, the one that breaks down, the one that's making you feel the aches and the pains, the one that hurts, that's decaying. We're going to get rid of all that because according to the working by which he is able even to subdue all things unto himself, we're going to get that glorious body with him, Shaul Paul is telling us. Um, that was verse 21 of chapter 3, sorry. Um, but that's good too. That was chapter 3. And verse 21. No, you also want that one. I'm going back now to Philippians 1, 21 to 24. Oh. I just read the wrong one first. Philippians 3, 21 is what I read, which is also good, but Philippians 1, 21. For to me to live is Christ, and to die is gain. How can it be better than living for him? Living with him. <laughs> Being in heaven with him. That if I live in the flesh, this is the fruit of my labor, yet I shall choose, I know not, for I'm in a strength between two, having desire to depart and be with the Messiah Christ, which is far better. Nevertheless, to abide in the flesh is more needful for you. What was all Paul saying? He was being a good spiritual father. I want to go home and be with my Lord. That's the best. I can't wait. I'm looking forward to that, but I'm also tugged because at the same time, I want to stay here to help you, to pour into you what you need to know to grow in your faith. That's what he was saying. But notice where he, what, what he was saying, that to, to him to, to live is, is Christ, but to die is gain. And in 2 Corinthians 5, 6 and verse 8, these are also um, to prove, because remember we want to see that we're not just building something on one scripture. Uh, 2 Corinthians 5, 
And verse 6 says, Therefore we are always confident, knowing that while we are home in the body, we are absent from the Lord. We are here in our bodies right now, and yes, of course, the Spirit of the Lord is in us, but we're not in the presence of the Lord where we're in the presence of each other right now is what is being said. It's being said. <laughs> verse 7, even for we walk by faith, not by sight. I believe I will one day see myself in heaven with my Lord and Savior. I will see him face to face. And that's verse 8. We are confident, I say, and willing rather to be absent from the body to be present with the Lord. I love Fanny Crosby, blind from birth, wrote many of our beautiful hymns that we love to sing still to this day. And someone was talking to her about her blindness once and saying, you know, are you disappointed that you're, you're you know, never going to sing the earthly things? And she says, oh, honey, no. The first thing my eyes will see is my Savior's face. Is that not beautiful? Yes. <laughs> she had quite a testimony. If you're not familiar with her, she had quite a testimony. So, I think I have made the thought clear of the three phases of the resurrection. The fact that um, we are in our body, we are separate from the Lord. When we are apart from this body in this time period, we are immediately with the Lord. That there is nothing in between this does away with the, I don't know what to call it, doctrine, but the belief, whatever word you want to put, a soul sleep. It doesn't say that we go to sleep and one day we wake up. They take it off of the phrase that those who are asleep, but remember that was only the euphemism, the way they refer to our saying would pass away or you know, whatever words they use. It's just the softer way than saying they're dead because it kind of hurts to hear that because of our flesh, okay? Let's get to verse 6 because we're going to have to tie things up here soon. It says, Blessed and holy is the one who has a part in the first resurrection. That saved people throughout all the ages have a part in that first resurrection. That's why they're blessed and why they're considered holy. How are we holy? We are holy because we are in Messiah, in Christ. He is the Holy One. Our parsha this past week has been heavy on, Be ye holy, for I am holy. I went through a whole study on it. You will start seeing holiness jump out all over when you study on it. But the beautiful part I saw the Lord telling us, actually, in the portion of Scripture we were to read in that week, three different times we were commanded, be holy because I am holy. And it might not say it exactly the same way each time, but, but that was the thought. And if you think that and you feel like me, it's like, okay, I'm trying, but I've got the unclean lips like Isaiah, Lord. I've got, you know, search my heart to see if there be any evil way in me. Like the read said, how do we do this? How do we live this holy life? And you can begin to feel a burden and weighed down and a crushing. And I know that's not what the Lord wanted, but I'm seeking his answer in Scripture. And it jumped out. Be ye holy, for I am holy. There's the key. He is the Holy One in us. He does it. All we do is yield. Yield yourself to him. When we're told in Romans 12 to be a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable unto him. That's what it's saying. And that ties right in to, we were in um, Leviticus, in Biakra, in Leviticus, in our parasha readings, where we're being told to be holy. And every time he says it, you will see he doesn't ever leave you without the solution. He always tells you, because I am. You be holy in me. Hide in me. Shaul Paul said that we're to be crucified daily, that, that we're to crucify this flesh. It's to be dead. It's to die. It's to be buried resurrected in his life, in his holiness. That's how you put on holiness. Just yield to him and let him do it. And thankfully, thankfully, God looks at us through Yeshua Jesus and sees us as what we will one day truly be as holy. So just a little side note because it's perfect timing. Um, back to chapter 20 and verse 6. Blessed and holy is the one who has part in the first resurrection. Over these, the second of death has no power. That second death is what I've been talking about because we won't get to it in its entirety. Let's take a sneak peek. Verse 14, right down at the, the, before the end of this chapter, we read, Then death and Hades were thrown into the lake of fire. This is the second death, the lake of fire. So I think that makes it very clear. The second death culminates, ends in hell, the lake of fire. 
Okay, we'll take that in more explanation when we hit verse 14. But I want to give us that. I always like to read the end. You know, I don't like to have to wait. <laughs> so we get the end. That, um, and that is separation from God forever. If you really catch that for a moment, it could just about take your breath away when you realize. But for the grace of God, there we would be. And if that doesn't light a fire under you, and I don't mean hellfire, but a fire under you to get out that door and tell everyone that you care about, everyone you come in contact with, show them a resurrected life, a power, a holiness that it is honoring unto the Lord, that they will want what you have. And you can say, this is what you want. That shalom, that peace you see in me, that answer in my tribulation and my trial, that one that I cling to and hold on to that helps me get through the tough spots, is Him. Let me tell you how you can know Him too, that you might not end up in that second death. It should, we don't want that, we don't wish that on anyone. And only for a moment, in a brief moment, I'm taken back to my neighbor's fire. And I saw fire up close. I saw fire that took a life. I saw the horrors and the ugliness of it, and that's just an earthly fire. That's not hellfire forever, <clears throat> separate from the love of our God, from holiness, from purity, from joy, <clears throat> from everything glorious. Oh, even those who you're upset with, how could you wish that on them? And why the Lord can say even to love your enemy. Because if you have a heart for a human life, you cannot even wish that on your enemy. You want to see your enemy saved. You want to see them turn. What better way to gain than to have them not die and be separated forever from the Lord. Because then they won the Satans. He won that soul. He gets that victory. No. Pray for their salvation. Amen. And I guarantee you, the one that you're holding that animosity toward, you start praying for them, something happens to you. <laughs> you can't stay angry. You can't stay with that animosity when you start praying for them. The Lord changes your own heart. And you see them as one of the one who died for. You know, he died for me. But he died for that one that I want to hate. And I certainly don't want to be calling one he loves something less than that. So on that note, let us just finish our phrase here. They live out, oops, go back up to verse 6. They live out the thousand years. Um, second death has no power. No power. Never. Uh-uh. Doesn't come back. Never, 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 never. And I've only just begun. <laughs> but they will be priests of God and of Messiah Christ, and will reign with him a thousand years. Here's that phrase again, a thousand years. I think the Lord's getting his point across to us. But what does it mean to be priests? Well, remember, let's go all the way back to the beginning of our book, to Revelation chapter 1, verses 5 and 6. Some of you had to be here a number of years ago. That one's frozen, and the other one... God, don't ever count on electronics in this day and age. <laughs> Chapter 1, verses 5 and 6, and from Yeshua Jesus, Messiah Christ, who is the faithful witness and the first begotten of the dead and the prince of the kings of the earth and to him that loveth us and washed us from our sins in his own blood, he has made us a kingdom of priests unto God and his Father to him be glory forever and ever. Amen. What's that telling us? Those of us who are in Messiah have a role. Remember when God gave Israel the words of God, the Torah, the very words of God, and said, be the priest to the nation, and Israel did not take it to the nations like they were supposed to, so God said, okay, I'm going to raise up another people. I'm going to let them be priests for a time so that the word will go out, not just to the nations, but will also come back to you, Israel, so you'll see, hey, I let go of something precious, something I want to, and provoke them to jealousy. That's what's going on here. We should be living out that kind of life that we are like a priest representing our God, our Heavenly Father, our Lord Jesus that we love, representing Him to the world that doesn't know Him. 
That's who we are to be. That's who they are to be during the tribulation. Also, it is saying that they are um, those who, and these would be the ones, obviously, if they're priests of, of God and of Messiah Jesus during the tribulation, they're the ones who come to that saving faith. And they're the ones who will reign with him a thousand years. So they're promised that also, that they'll go into that millennial kingdom. Remember the sheep and goats? The sheep went into the kingdom because they were faithful. They showed their faith, not because of their faithfulness, but their, they, they acted out what was true in their hearts. They helped those in need because they had the love of the Lord in them. They will be rewarded with the millennial kingdom. They are, in the tribulation time, priests to carry the message out. 144,000 are like priests to carry the message out. We have the two witnesses who carry the message out. We have the angels in heaven who are carrying the message out that he also, Lord, also put it into people who get saved. And thankfully, if the number of beheaded can't be numbered, many, many, many can be saved in faith. Horrible that they have to live through that time, but wonderful that they do get salvation and they do get millennial reign and go on into eternity with the Lord. And we'll get to those when we come to those. But we are at a conclusion today. Uh, with the end of verse 6, are there any questions, comments? Yes. The Bible says, well, Jesus says in the Bible that he has the keys to heaven and hell. Yes. If you have the keys, that means you can get in and get out, right? <sighs> You're thinking of it as a doorway. Um, I see it as authority. He has power over it. I'm thinking of someone that he has the ability to go into and out of. Well, except that we never read of anyone coming out of hell in Scripture. Um, I'm going to bring next week when we go into hell and different names, we go into the books and all that, we'll look at um, hell, Hades, we'll look at you know, the second death again. As we go into that list, look at that question as we come to it, because again, for me, the key means authority. It means rule over, it means control. And if I've got the keys, I've got control. You're seeing it literally as opening and closing the door. <coughs> but, because he holds a key. So, in essence, we both can be right that way. Because he's not going to open the door to hell. over this whole world. That means he can go, to me, he can go anywhere. He is a God. He yes. has the ability to go anywhere. Yes. He can go in if he wants to, grab somebody if he wants to, or not grab somebody. That he has that ability. He has the ability. But he has the ability, but he does not go into hell and bring <coughs> someone out. Because when you leave this earth, your your um, position is sealed. You don't get. No one gets a second chance. Um, Hebrews 10 tells us that it's appointed that a man wants to die, and after this, the judgment. Your fate is sealed. You and in fact. Um, there are those who believe that, and I'll bring out the scripture next week, because there isn't time this week, that the Lord went and preached to those that had already passed away and gave them a chance to accept. That's not what was meant by this verse. But that's people. That's not him. That's people can't get out. But to me, he can. God can do anything. Yes. But God doesn't sin. <laughs> he doesn't lie. And no, I, I don't see him going, going to hell. 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 But he, no, I mean. Yeah. He can go to hell. Now, he has the ability, he has the keys to get in there. Well, he made it. In other words, he can he show people, he can take somebody that can show them what but, it was like to come back and tell us. Well, in essence, that happened right here. That happened right here. Because he gave us that sight. And it, the um, rich man even said, send someone back to tell my brothers so that they won't end up here. And he says, even if one comes back from the dead, they won't believe that's what I mean about this. having someone see hell and bring them out of, to come back and tell us about it. I we, can give you a book. We hear of stories of those who who had yeah, in their minds a vision of it, who felt that they were there. We, I know that there are those, and I'm, I'm going to stand against it, Sherry. I understand the teaching that you're trying to say. It's not a teaching. Well, it's not a teaching. It's actual people who are living the Lord has taken to show them what hell is like and bring them out. They haven't died and gone there. Oh, okay. I see what you're trying to say. The same way that he showed John heaven. Yes. Okay. Yes. I can't argue with yes. them because that's between them and the Lord. All I can do is stand here with my scriptures and just tell you clearly 
anyone who does go into hell in an unsafe state is there forever. They don't come back out. When Satan is cast into hell, we never worry that in the future he will come out and inflict on on the world again. It will never be the um, If God, okay, God is creator of all things, all beings, but he also created the law about who will go in. Yes. Into hell, into heaven. He said he created the hell for the so devil if, and if he had his voice angels. back, the God who created the law cannot go above his own law. He is still under that law, and he can't break that law. I won't right? say he's under, but he won't go against. Right, he won't go, go against, against it, but he has to go with what he said. Yes, he what he said. Right? Exactly. Like, like, he like when he tells us we're safe forever, we know we're safe okay. forever. So if he had, in, from the uh, Old Testament <laughs> to the New Testament, had laid down what it is that we will take, that what it would take to go into hell mm -hmm. and into heaven and to paradise, it doesn't, he, he it doesn't, can, yeah, he can't it doesn't change. change. He doesn't, doesn't change, change the rules on this. Yes. Right. I think Sherry got her point across clear when she said that they had been given vision, that like Yochanan John, John was given yes. vision. Yeah. That's, that's, yes, that's a, a little yeah. different. Yeah. I've got to hold us because we have to watch that clock today. I'm going to close this in prayer. Those who help Roger, please help Roger. Those who want to keep discussing, go ahead. But you might have to take your discussion downstairs to get out of the workers' ways, okay? But uh, I don't mean to cut anyone off, and we can bring it back because we'll hit it still. We're still going to go look at the rest of Chapter 20. You'll see we're going to go into um, what comes, Gog and Magog. Okay, we're going to have to look at that. What happens at the end of the millennial time? And it's horrendous how many end up on the wrong side. What do I mean by that? Come back next week and we'll talk about it. We'll look at Great White Throne. We'll look at hell. But then we get into the glories of 21 and 22. So whatever's coming. Let's close in prayer real quick. And then, uh, like I said, we can all move where we need to be. Uh, hallelujah. Praise you, O Lord, our God. We are thankful for our sure salvation. And we are thankful to know that one day we will see you face to face and be with you forever and ever and ever. Lord, let that so burn in our hearts that as we go out this door, that we will be lights to those who don't know it, that you will be able to put into our mouths the words that we need to say, that, Lord, we know often it is our lives, our actions speaking so loud that they don't even hear our words. So let us live it out. Let us show them something that will draw them to your saving love, that they too can have eternity with you forever. And thank you that it is forever and ever and ever. Thank you for your promises, sure and true. And thank you that you are with us, even to the end of this age, and with us, are we with you through all of eternity. We praise you, we fall on our faces before you, we shout our hallelujahs, and we thank you. Oh, Lord God, holy, 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 almighty God, hallelujah, in Jesus' name, amen. amen. Okay. Thank you, my love. Thank you,